I, like many, enjoy studying great leaders in history in order to learn from them, whether it be Otto von Bismarck, who served as the great uniter of his nation, or Napoleon, who snatched victory from the jaws of defeat time and time again. We have a comparable legend living in our day, the statesman history will remember as President Xi Jinping. Xi, much like Napoleon, fundamentally changes our world by his mere existence, and understanding him and what he stands for gives us a baseline from which we can analyze those who staunchly oppose his rule on the world stage, actors who are the furthest thing from insignificant. Quote, I see the detention houses, the feckleness of human relationships. I understand politics on a deeper level. End of quote. Those are the words of the most powerful man in the world currently, which, at a quick glance, seem to be rather pessimistic, but when you think about what the words actually mean and contrast it with Xi's seemingly genuine optimism and rhetoric, you realize there's more to his words than what meets the eye. During the Dark Ages in Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, there was a feeling the people existed simply to serve those who ruled over them. This was a result of the main mode of production at the time, feudalism, which functioned by having people farm land that supposedly belonged to the king and paying the king a share of the surplus they produced. This was a step from the slave system in the sense that this was more efficient given that there was actual incentive for the people to work besides avoiding punishment. They got to keep some of the surplus they produced. As trade naturally increased over time and global populations began to shift, we saw the beginning of the Renaissance or rebirth in the 1600s as ancient Greek texts arrived back to Europe. With it, this idea that one should just serve your natural superiors began to shift ever so slowly. See, increased trade leads to increased cities, as all cities are trade cities. Cities naturally assert power with their large populations and gathering of knowledge and intellectuals. During the Renaissance, these cities birthed an idea that was reinforced incarnated many times throughout history. The government has an obligation to improve the lives of its population. It's an idea that could only come from city folk. After all, the self-sufficiency of the hunter-gatherers and farmers is just another word for poverty. Specialization and trade make us rich, and to do those things you need a government of action to fight for working families. Such was the origin of what we call statecraft. Public education, the funding of R&D, the promotion of art and culture which bind people together, what defines the modern world is these activities done on a mass scale regardless of ideology. Statecraft is the art of managing what Emile de Kim described as organic solidarity. This is the name of Xi's quote if one grasps it correctly. And thus, we begin to see why the man is so optimistic. A thorough understanding of Marxism by Xi means he understands the progress of history. As intelligent life continues to move to even higher modes of production, inevitably from muscle to water to steam to fusion, one can begin to see the lives of people improve significantly. Billions are raised out of poverty and subjection with the passing of time, and a statesman can speed the process along. But why would he be motivated to do such a thing, you might ask? Xi has the boldness to dream like few other men do, and that comes from seeing hell itself while coming out the other end intact and thus stronger. Born June 15th, 1953, the second son of Xi Zhongxuan and his wife Kui Jin during the era of Mao's rule. When the Cultural Revolution struck his sister killed, his father was imprisoned as a traitor, his mother was forced to denounce her husband, his secondary education was cut short, resulting in Xi stealing books from libraries to educate himself, and was then forced to work in a rural village, eventually being arrested for the desertion of the post and forced to dig ditches. Xi's goal is simple 
to protect his people and to ensure that such a thing never happens to young children ever again in China. He wants everyone to be gloriously rich, to paraphrase Deng Xiaoping. His perfect world was taken from him, but his ultimate revenge isn't to take such things away from others, but rather to give it to anyone who could ever desire such. His trials have given him the energy, the drive, and the passion to back up those redder-than-red dreams. From the One Belt, One Road initiative, which helps to build infrastructure and raise whole nations out of poverty, to his purging of corrupt officials, he is making his dream a reality. And it's not just his dream, it's the dream of a billion Chinese, and all Marxists, to be rich, to push the species forward, and to gain the respect and dignity lost to what can only be described as the forces of evil in the world. Intelligent, wise, diligent, beyond measure, Xi understands that a leader puts the people first and leads for them. And that is exactly what he does.